This is the 23rd Armistice Day, and we are at war in the Atlantic Ocean with German submarines. A large part of our fleet is guarding the sea lanes to Iceland and convoying merchant ships a part of the way to the British Isles. Our destroyers have been fired on by German submarines, and American naval officers and sailors have been killed in the performance of their duties. This is not a one-sided affair in the North Atlantic. The only reason that you have not heard of the German submarines sunk by American depth bombs and gunfire is because it is not it is the policy not to announce these sinkings, so that the German Admiralty will wonder for a time which German submarines are afloat and which are in David Jones' locker. It is the fixed policy of the United States to supply Great Britain and Russia with whatever airplanes, guns, and other equipment and supplies necessary to defeat Germany. The Neutrality Act will shortly, perchance within 48 hours, be so modified that our merchant ships can fight back and keep the German submarines' heads under water and sail on any seas to deliver their cargoes of munitions and food. Would you not like to be present in the British port when the first American escorted convoy comes steaming in? What a welcome there will be by the sorely pressed British who have so gallantly defended their islands for these two years. The Stars and Stripes has once again taken its place beside the British Union Jack in this war defending civilization itself. Why have we embarked upon this course? Because the mad German race, led by brigands and allied with banditti, has threatened the rest of the world with destruction. The President of the United States told you in his Navy Day speech that our government had an official German map showing plans for dividing most of South America into five vassal states and a document outlining Nazi plans for the elimination of religion in the world. The Nazis have quite an assignment there, don't they? Religion means the conscious relation between man and God and the expression of that relation in human conduct. Using their usual tactics of dividing and then destroying, the Nazis have undertaken to split all mankind from God and then will, I assume, attack the rest of us before they attack God in his heaven. But they have already destroyed God in themselves by indoctrinating themselves with the grim lie that might makes right. They have tried to eliminate entire peoples who have done them no wrong, but who fought for their own homes and firesides. They have seized all of the wool blankets in Norway to protect their soldiers against the Russian winter and told the Norwegian people to freeze. The crimes that they have committed are numberless, and the weight of them is incalculable. They have caused an infinity of woes. They have tried to array all of the haves against the have-nots, and then tried to destroy both in order that they might strip and enslave them. We know that their passion is to enslave the rest of the world and to bury freedom herself forty fathoms deep. We know the causes of these woes, and our fixed policy is to defeat the authors of them by whatever means necessary. The details of accomplishing this defeat are in the hands of the admirals and the generals, directed by their commander-in-chief, the President of the United States. What has been the result of the war in Russia to date? The wounded Russian bear has smacked many a youthful Nazi to the ground, and many a cold-blooded Prussian veteran has died. The fact that the Germans have changed their tune shows to what extent the well-prepared Red Army has fought back. They now begin to tell their people that it will be a long war, for they themselves are beginning to feel the losses of perhaps one-third of their effective fighting troops. Russia is yet holding. The seven seas are commanded by the British and American navies. We have allies. You know that we are far stronger than we were two years ago. The time has come for all arguments to stop in this country. Our policies have been determined. The debate has ended. The spirit of the people of the United States is now aroused. We know that we cannot live in a world dominated by the Germans, and we will not live in such a world if it takes the last drop of American blood. We have pledged ourselves to our children, to our children's children, that we will leave them America as we found her, free and strong and independent. No foreign armies will set foot on our soil. Before that comes, we would fight at the North Pole, 
under the blazing suns of the equator and round and round the world. Once the die is cast, the American spirit is irresistible. The enemy will find out that we are united. That flag that you saw proudly carried down the street today has never known defeat, and once again it will be victoriously defended. Hitler, relying on disunion in our ranks, will find a united America. He will be struck down and confounded by capital, working hand in hand with labor and the mines, the foundries, and the giant manufacturing plants and shipyards. These labor disputes must be settled. Capital and labor must go hand in hand with one paramount aim, and that is to win this war. A labor leader who, for selfish reasons, undertakes to impede or hinder our war effort must be controlled. Likewise, the selfish profiteer who is trying to feather his nest without regard for the common weal must be controlled. The rank and file of the American people are patriotic and will cheerfully give their all to preserve their liberties. But they will not tolerate racketeering in labor's ranks, nor hold up profiteering in capital's ranks. Let us all get in step and close the ranks to win this war. Let us tighten up our belts and the spirits high, compose all of our differences, adjust all of our disputes, and our industry, our wealth, our labor, our army and navy, our people will see this thing through under the leadership of the President of the United States and Congress and make Germany and her allies bite the dust no matter how long the struggle lasts. The flag went by today. That flag tonight is at the mast of our warships that are searching the coal in the North Atlantic for the submarines. You may rest assured, foul Hitler, perfidious Mussolini, and any other vulture hovering around for the kill that will never be made will be defeated. We will sustain our country, and one of these years, Armistice Day, will be celebrated by new celebrants as Victory Day, and the sun will rise on that day on an America which is still the land of the free and the home of the brave. I thank you. The proper observance of Armistice Day 1941 is more than a commemoration. It is a symbol and a pledge. We commemorate and remember the soldiers and sailors who died in the World War, which ended with the armistice in 1918. We memorialize those who have been killed in the present war in the service of their country. And in this commemoration, we pledge ourselves to keep alight the torch of liberty, which they sacrificed their lives to save. <clears throat> Blow out, you bugles, over the rich dead. Not one of these so lonely and poor of old, but dying made us rarer gifts than gold. These put the world away, gave up the years to be of wake and hope, poured out the red sweet wine of youth, and that unhoped serene that men called age, and those that might have been their sons, they gave their immortality. Twenty-two years ago today, we had fought and won a war to make the world safe for democracy. And safe for democracy, the world then was. Had the soldiers who had fought the war been given the task of making the peace, they would have made whatever sacrifice of selfish interest might have been necessary to have prevented a recurrence of a world war. But the soldiers were considered to have done their job, and the politicians took over at the council tables of Versailles. They are the self-determination of peoples, the reasonable separation of countries on racial and economic lines, were sacrificed as spoils of war. Not daring to call it conquest because of their political careers at home, the treaty makers provided the diplomatic ruse of economic mandate so that by that means popular liberty was subjugated for economic protection. 
The leaders of the established democracies, ever more eager to squeeze war indemnities from the conquered peoples than to lend their aid to the establishment and confirmation of democratic forms of government, succeeded in reducing the conquered peoples to such desperation that they submitted to various dictatorships rather than make the sacrifice which the preservation of their democracy with its payment of the heavy debt of war entailed. The result of this selfish political greed and manipulation has been the present cataclysm. Today, Great Britain, the United States, and the democracies of South America alone are left as free peoples under democratic and republican forms of government in the world. This is no war of political leaders seeking merely additional trade or the extension of territory. It is organized aggression of powers hostile not only to democracy, but to all those moral, religious, and philosophical principles from which democracy has sprung. Historically, democracy is a concept and consequence of the New Testament and the Christian religion. Not until the spread of the gospel was there anywhere in the world the idea of the importance of the freedom and opportunity of the individual and the supremacy of the citizen over the state. The political idea that the citizen creates the state and that the governor is responsible to the citizen for the responsibility and power that he wields. It is only there, since the spread of the Christian religion and the fall of the Roman Empire, that men have had the idea of a state where all men are citizens, all are equal under the law, all, no matter how humble their station, may worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience, assemble to express their judgment and opinions of government freely, own property as individuals, and direct a system or pattern of government for a life protected by harmony, security, and peace. Armistice Day, 1941, therefore, is first of all a day of commemoration and remembrance, of thanksgiving for the sacrifices that our soldiers and sailors have made for free government and liberal institutions in the country where we live. It is equally a day when we should pledge ourselves to continue those sacrifices, to preserve the American way of life in democracy, and the American way of life will not be preserved except by the active, unselfish, and energetic sacrifice of the individual citizen. As our liberties and rights and privileges are greater under our form of government than under any other form ever devised by man, so are our obligations and responsibilities correspondingly greater. The preservation of our rights and liberties demand the daily sacrifice and compromise of all classes of capital and of labor as well as of the unorganized 80% which supports them both. The preservation of our rights and liberties demands that daily sacrifice and that compromise by all the citizens of these United States. The tree of liberty must be daily watered by the blood of patriots and of traitors. Let our prayer be, therefore, that the forces of democracy will win the victory, and that their representatives in making the settlement for peace will make that settlement permanent by using as their guide the eternal laws of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Americans all have pride in your America.
program is presented to Americans in Dixie over a special red, white, and blue network. It comes to you as a presentation of the Memphis American Legion Post Number One, the Memphis Press Scimitar, a script-powered newspaper, and its radio station, WMPS. Cooperating with us are American Legion Post and radio broadcasting stations in many cities in Dixie. For their generous cooperation, we thank them. Today, you are hearing music ably presented by our orchestra, composed of members of the Memphis Federation of Musicians, under the direction of Mr. Joseph Cortese, and our chorus from the Young Men's Bible Class of the First Presbyterian Church in Memphis, under the direction of Mr. Jerome P. Robertson. tribute to Lieutenant General Ben Lear, to all the officers, to all the men of the Second Army. Those of us privileged to live in the Mid-South have been inspired and thrilled by the presence among us of these many brave young Americans, ready to a man to defend us against any enemy. To all the armies of the United States of America, we dedicate George M. Cohan's immortal Over There. Thank you. 
Our nation is in the midst of a vital campaign to raise funds for the American Red Cross. To every American who wants to do his part to ease the war suffering of our soldiers, sailors, and Marines, and their families, who are giving more than their part, we say, make as big a contribution to the Red Cross as you feel your love of America and your means justify. Give generously tomorrow, won't you? The need is great. Now, hail to our Navy. On the oceans and in the air, our men of the Navy are searching out the enemy. We salute the Navy of the United States. our nation's existence, the United States Marine Corps has been in action. <clears throat> Marines were on hand that wintry night when Washington crossed the Delaware. They've been on hand in every fray since then. At Bellu Wood and the Argonne, the Marines were there. Today, in the Philippines, we can't imagine any Marine if ordered to retreat, saying as one Marine captain said when ordered to retreat in the Argonne, retreat hell, we just got here. In recent weeks, the Japanese throwing their full forces at wake. A gallant band of Marines radioed the Navy a request for more Japs. To the United States Marines, ever faithful, we give you their hymn. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, 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 oh,